Uh, there's a couple of seats here and there still open if you want to sit down somewhere. All right. Thank you so much for coming today. I'm really excited about this wonderful talk that Francisco is going to give us. Um, first, I wanted to thank everybody for coming, and I also wanted to thank the local art festival and the arts collaborative here at SLU for helping to fund Francisco's visit. Um, I also wanted to point out this is the second major event here at SLU. The first one with, was with Katie Hyde, who's actually a good friend of Francisco's. Um, and there is also, um, she gave us the academic side of memory in Chile and activism in Chile. Now we're going to get the artist's side of, of Chilean art. And um, what I'd like to talk about a little bit is that this is, there's a historical tie here uh, with Francisco. So he was here close to exactly two decades ago, in 1989. Um, if you guys have visited the ODY library, you may have seen the two beautiful um, and very intricate murals that are up in the periodical section. And if you haven't seen them, you should go visit them. Um, they were made by an arts collective that Francisco was part of. Um, named the Orlando Letelier Mural Brigade, which was named after his father. For those of you not familiar with what happened to his father, he was a very prestigious diplomat and economist from Chile who served as the Chilean ambassador to the United States under the Allende um, administration. And like many supporters of Allende, after the military coup in 1973, supporters of Allende, officials in the Allende government were detained, put into concentration camps, um, and Francisco's father, Orlando, had that happen, and then he was forced into exile with his family. And he came here to the United States, um, worked at a progressive think tank called the Institute for Policy Studies, and became a very important leader of Chileans in exile who were putting pressure on the United States government to um, try, and, try and get Pinochet out of power, to get rid of the dictatorship. And because of that, he became a threat to Pinochet, and um, quite tragically, he was killed in a car bomb set by uh, the Pinochet regime in Washington, DC. So this is a terrorist act on US soil. Um, but this. Mural Brigade was, was made by Chilean, uh, Chilean exiles, uh, artists, and Francisco was, he was telling me, quite young at the time, um, was, a, was a mentored by a number of other, uh, other uh, Chileans in exile um, into the art of murals. He was going to tell us more about that. Um, and this week, he's creating a sister mural for us at SUNY Potsdam. I'm just going to ask if there's some of the people working on it, if they would just stand up for a second. Don't be shy. I can see some of them sitting there. All right, let's give a round of applause. Thank you for your work. Um, so these are City Potsdam students who have come here. Um, and we'd, I'd like to point out that there's going to be a uh, closing fiesta where you can see the beautiful mural unveiled and have food and music at the same time. So this is 3 p.m. Friday, SUNY Potsdam, in the Brainerd um, Auditorium right across from the uh, Gibson Gallery. So come see it. You can see Francisco again and also um, look at the beautiful artwork that's been made as a collaborative effort with SUNY students, SLU students, um, and Francisco. And on that note, I'm going to hand it over to Francisco, and he's going he's gonna to run us through some wonderful um, images from art, murals, and activism. So I'm going to turn this off. And I just turned myself on. Can everybody hear me over there? Thank you. Thanks for coming to listen to, to me. This is extremely personal for me. Uh, Tamara misspoke. It wasn't two decades, it was three decades ago. And so I was considerably younger, and I feel in many ways that um, those earlier murals were what propelled me and you know, fortified my, my resolve to continue to do that work. And I'm very grateful for uh, that 
push and that fair wind that St. Lawrence University gave us 30 years ago. And so I feel, I feel like I've come back to give an account of myself in some ways. Now, it would be presumptuous for me to say that I'm going to talk to you all about Chilean art, which would be the same as somebody standing up and telling you that they're going to talk to you all about the art of the United States. It's a big and huge topic. So really, I'm talking to you about my own personal experience as an exiled Chilean and what has happened to the culture of Chile that left with the exile community. There's a photo up here, and I wanted to start with this photograph. That's Salvador Allende addressing the United Nations. Basically, he came to the United Nations to denounce US intervention in the affairs of Chile. My father is sitting over his left shoulder up there. You can kind of see that these men, Allende, my father, were incredibly charismatic men. And we have to remember through these historical tragedies that we're talking about people that were flesh and bone and who were special people for particular reasons and got people to um, do extraordinary things. As many of you know, on September 11, 1973, notwithstanding the international and global attention that Allende um, called to the intervention in the United States, the armed forces, with the uh, help of the United States agencies and the United States government, but clearly the armed forces of Chile overthrew the democratically elected government of Salvador Allende. I lived kind of in a building that might or might not, we often argue, be in this picture, way in the background. So we were on the sixth floor of an apartment building. The bombing occurred through Hawker Hunter jets that the United States had very graciously sold to Chile to protect themselves from what, I don't know, but they were used to depose the president. We didn't know my father was not in the moneda at that time, so we thought he had died. A few hours later, we were told, uh, somebody called to say he was alive, that he had been taken prisoner, and this is him being taken prisoner by a man with a sh machine gun who had been his bodyguard and had not shown up that morning to drive him to work. My father had spoken to Salvador Allende in the early mornings, and he had said, I'm going to the Moneda, and Salvador Allende had said to him, he was Minister of Defense at the time, and Salvador Allende asked my father to go to the Ministry of Defense. When he arrived there, they barred his entrance, and then he felt a machine gun in his back, and it was the bodyguard that had not shown up. This photograph was published later, now, Salvador Allende was a family friend. My father had known him since he was a young student. I'm considerably older than my father was when he died. My father was only 41 years old when he died. I'm almost 60. But I, uh, my older brother in this picture, it said in family lore, and you know how um, reliable family lore can be, but supposedly, his first words were Allende, as he was born during the, campaign, the 1958 campaign. Uh, el the election was in 1958, but um, he, my brother had been born you know, a year before that. So supposedly, one of his first words were Allende. And we grew up going back to Chile all the time. After the coup, of course, my father was in jail in concentration camps including a concentration camp near Punta Arenas, around 250 miles from the Antarctic Circle, pretty harsh conditions. Prisoners were forced to build the camp. But he was released due, I suppose, to international pressure. And we returned to the United States where we had lived 
before the Allende government. On September 10, uh, 1976, there was a concert. Joan Baez, many of you in the room know who she is. Maybe some of you younger people don't remember who she is, but she's a great American folk singer and was singing to um, help restore democracy in Chile. Name of Pete Seeger there. Um, the experience of the Chilean people had really captured the imagination of people all over the world. It had been the first time a socialist had been freely elected using a democratic system in the Western Hemisphere, Allende, and the people of his generation and my father's generation believed in a peaceful path towards socialism. 11 days later, on September 21st, 1976, as he drove to work with two of his co-workers, a young Jewish-American woman from Passaic, New Jersey, Ronnie Carpenter Moffat and her husband, Michael Moffat, were in the car with my father. When the bomb was detonated through remote control, as they drove right past the Chilean embassy, where my father had served as Salvador Allende's ambassador to Washington, D.C. for almost three years, they detonated the bomb. My father died almost immediately. Ronnie was able to escape, but drowned in her own blood on the sidewalk of Embassy Row with a piece of shrapnel in her, you know, lodged in her neck. Michael Moffat survived the blast. Often, people talk about the murder and forget to mention Ronnie, because this was an American who died on the streets of Washington, D.C. And it had a lot to do with why perhaps the investigation proceeded into the assassination. This is two days after the death. This is Joan Baez. At that concert that I showed you a, a, a picture of, during the concert when my father was going to address people, he was informed that the Chilean junta, led by Augusto Pinochet, General Augusto Pinochet, had stripped him of his nationality. And the words, I was born a Chilean, I am a Chilean, and I will die a Chilean, was his response to being you know, given this information right as he was about to go up to the podium to address people at that event. This is three days after his death on the streets of Washington, D.C. People came from all over the world, certainly the Chilean exile community. But in this photograph, there are many people who had fought against the Vietnam War, people of different countries. Right in the center of this photograph is Eugene McCarthy, who had um, run for the presidency here in the United States. Uh, Allende's widow is in the picture, and I, I'm kind of right here in the foreground with my three brothers. That's another brother in the white suit there. A year after that murder, the Chilean community came together to commemorate the deaths of Ronnie and Orlando. And we decided to do something that had become very much part of Chilean culture. But Chile didn't really have a big mural painting tradition. We had a tradition of working class youth joining with left wing parties to go out on the streets to write the names of candidates. But during the, the campaign for the presidency of Allende, Artists joined these kind of squads of kids that would write names on the streets of candidates of left wing, and they started developing a very basic visual vocabulary. So you would see popular unity, which was the coalition of, of parties that were supporting Salvador, Salvador Allende, or the name Allende, and a fist, or a flower, or a rose, or a star. And that sort of became a participatory collective form of making art on the streets developed during the Allende government. So we were celebrating and commemorating. Now, this is 1977. Pinochet is still in power. We have no clear indication of whether the investigation into the deaths is going to 
continued for. And we had no idea that these deaths and these murders in Washington, D.C. would be one of the many tools that Chilean people used to finally topple the dictatorship. But of course, it was the first time that Chileans, Chilean artists had come together in the United States from different places to commemorate something in the nation's capital. It was very important for many people of generations. I was only 17. I basically put up those plywood panels and set up the scaffolding and was allowed by these older artists to help and participate. The man to your right there is Rene Castro, well-known and regarded Chilean artist who's returned to Chile but lived in exile in San Francisco for many years. And he, my brother and I, came together to create the Orlando Letelier murals we did right after that. And we began to paint murals with young Chileans. First on the East Coast, this is in Spanish Harlem, in the United, you know, in New York City. But then we decided we need, we need to push this further. We weren't just a muralist brigade, of course. We traveled around in a white Dodge van that somebody had donated to the Chile Committee for Human Rights. And we traveled around with a human rights project, which was basically audiovisual stuff on big foam core cardboard, things that we would set up anywhere we went to inform people about what was going on in Chile. Often when we went places, there might not be an opportunity to paint a mural, but we would do what we're doing right now. Come together, talk about things, share pictures, share music. All the forms of our expressions in Chile, even those that had not been overtly political, suddenly became political acts. So for those of us in Chile and in exile, it was a way of remembering our country, but also it became political to just sing a Chilean song or recite the verses of Pablo Neruda or Nobel Prize winning poet. So it was, it was very wonderful feeling to arrive here. We're painting a mural underneath the L in Chicago in a Puerto Rican neighborhood with Puerto Rican uh, friends in solidarity with Chile. And what we're doing is recreating murals that had been whitewashed by the dictatorship, by the dictatorship in Chile. But also engaging in solidarity. I've said this to a couple of people um, today, that solidarity is never a one-way street. It's a two-way street. In an act of sharing, we're forever changed. In Chicago, and this is probably 1979, I became partially Puerto Rican. I learned about the history of Puerto Rico, and so we were uh, making murals that, you know, recaptured the murals that had been erased in Chile, but also including images, as you see here, this hand with colors of Puerto Rico. And this occurred in so many places. This is in Champaign, Urbana, on an earth earthworks garage, and everywhere we went, we would have input from the people in the community that were supporting Chile. This is very important, as some of you in this room know, that when you have to move to a new place, you feel a tremendous sense of tragedy and loss, and it takes a while to understand that perhaps you can stay where you've arrived and create a new life that doesn't necessarily let go of your old life. And that's a wonderful thing about the mural that we're creating in Potsdam right now. It's called Bridging Cultures. And it's also personally so important because I really feel like I'm bridging 30 years of time to come back here. We work with Native American artists. They had spray guns. <laughs> we were able to cap, you know, do a big wall. It was the biggest wall we had done, and it was so exciting to be able to get it, get it going in that way. Sometime in 1979, we were asked to paint a mural 
in San Francisco's Mission District. We were living in the Bay Area at that time. This is Casa Nicaragua, a small cultural center that was occurring during the Sandinista War. And on the day we were finishing the mural, I guess it's July 19th, um, the Sandinistas were victorious over the Somoza dictatorship. And so it became a place of celebration for the Nicaraguan community. Ernesto Cardenal, the man who became the, um, the Minister of Culture, Father Ernesto Cardenal, uh, for the Sandinista government, had come through here and seen the mural and we received an invitation to paint murals with the literacy campaign in Nicaragua. This is a poster for a mural that we did up in Coos Bay, Oregon. Longshoremen had decided to not unload ships laden with Chilean lumber, and we went up to paint a mural in the Union Hall there, not quite realizing how incredibly important it was. I was you know, pretty young at the time, but I quickly learned that the ILWU was a huge union with a great labor history and who could really make a huge impact. So for us to be able to paint a mural in the mural hall and have Jimmy Herman, then president of the union, to come and, you know, there my brother Jose is painting his hand, you know, put his hand as a signature on the wall, it was a huge thing. We realized that these murals not only recapture culture, but they're really tools to motivate people to, to kind of uh, oil the works of, of international solidarity. Literacy campaign, it looked just the same, right? <laughs> it was an extraordinary experience. There I am with Renee Castro squinting. I still have that same squint, people tell me, when I'm looking at things. But it was an extraordinary experience, not only because of the great hardships we faced and you know, kind of a Manawa that had been destroyed during the revolution, and, but also because of the excitement that people had that it was the first time in three generations, those of you who know, the Somoza regime was a dynasty, grandfather, son, and grandchild, so they had never really had the opportunity to go out on the wall and paint anything that meant anything to them. And mostly we were asked to paint the heroes of the revolution, so we painted probably 10 murals in a three week period with the help of many people, but we were busy all day long. We'd do designs when we came home in the evening for wherever we were gonna go arrive, but we'd also have a lot of help. And we were an international brigade. The woman in the center, Behan Kagri, is a Turkish woman. And it was great because her, her, her parents are both Jewish and Muslim. So many, many years before stuff, we already were, were seeing in an individual working with us how she could resolve things personally and how she could step across borders and work with us. There they are putting a grid on the wall. I just got these photographs from a remarkable photographer who lives in Denver who was in Nicaragua at that time. And I wanted to show you a few photographs of Nicaragua because right now it's really important for those of us who engaged in solidarity with Nicaragua to see what's happened, to kind of reassess, well, oh, so many people work for Nicaragua, for Nicaragua to be free, and it's not exactly free right now. But this was a typical day painting somewhere. Here's at the Ministry of Construction. And it was amazing how people would come up and go, what's that? What are you doing? That's incredible. Why don't you put something in there? In a free society, you pretty much expect people to say whatever they want and tell you what they want to see on the walls. Here we are at the Inca metal factory outside of Manawa in Masaya, a place that had been bombed from a large hill overlooking the town. And we arrived there at night and painted this mural overnight. 
There were truckers with their headlights on, allowing us to paint. We had no scaffolding, no cinder blocks worthy, or is what we could use. The wall was pitted with gunfire from the recent battles that had occurred. Earlier today, I was asked, well, what do you think the impact of murals and art making are on people? And I don't know. Here's this kid. You know, but I'm sure that this child remembers that day. And this young woman who was 15, I remember, and who had fought from the age of 12 to 15 in the revolution, she remembers this day. This, these photographs are very interesting to me because this was inside Samosa's bunker, where today is the, you know, the central part where the army, Sandinista army, operates. Many soldiers turned out, of course, the murals we created for them showed the heroes of the revolution, Sandino, Carlos Fonseca, Omar Pomares, but all the soldiers, different people showed up. But Ortega wasn't there. He just didn't show up. Allende's widow showed up for, the, for, for giving up the murals and many other people. Here's a man that was in the government be, behind her who was, a, who was a commander in the Sandinista revolution. Rene here is telling people, your triumph is also our triumph. And I guess that that's what sums up solidarity, is to be with people in moments of tragedy and hope and optimism, to just be with them. It doesn't matter where they're from. <laughs> but I really love to see this inside what is the Nicaraguan Pentagon, a group of people playing Nueva Canción. And I think that that's how military installations should be. There should be freedom and culture everywhere. Well, those murals became the subject of a lot of studies, and then during the Sandinista government, this was, this was during the literacy campaign that was instituted really in the first year of the Sandinista government. It brought a lot of other muralists to Nicaragua, here is a mural in Eugene, Oregon. It's painted in 1984. It was the first project where we'd have to splinter ourselves, and it was just me that went to Eugene, but worked with many artists there. I just got a call yesterday from a person that I met during this mural, who's another artist that helped me there. This is around 35 years ago. The mural was whitewashed after being up for around 15 or 20 years, it was the Methodist Center, the Council for Human Rights had left the building. On the morning that the wall had been painted white again by the owners of the building, someone wrote a great graffiti that said, fuck art, let's pray. <laughs> the person that called me wants to, you know, it's just an anecdote make what you want of it, but the person who called me yesterday wants to restore the mural, wants to like, it's possible nowadays to, you know, remove the paint and show the mural. But I said, I'm still alive. Let's just paint a new mural. Maybe that'll happen at the same site. Here's Nellie Macon Link, a great, a great uh, motivator of solidarity throughout the United States for Latin America. Here she is painting in Coos Bay. Of course, she was the link to bring a muralist group to support the ILWU and their boycott of Chilean lumber. A brilliant woman, and I really hope that I can return to Eugene to create a mural there that honors her and all the work they did. So Chilean murals, of course, were always full of music and food and all kinds of stuff, because we were trying to recreate the feeling of what's called the peña. It's basically a hoedown. It's basically, let's all get together 
make art, eat food, sing music. So music and art were indispensable, but in exile, solidarity was an important part. So this mural that we painted in Eugene, I painted with Alejandro Canales, the man uh, in the middle of this photograph, who was a great Nicaraguan artist who's passed on now. So it's a pretty picture, but, but these pretty pictures can't be judged by the same, the same uh, you know, rules that you would, you would judge a work of art in a museum. These are participatory collective works that are specific to historical moments. They're monuments to memory. And art that does that is important. You have to be able to look beyond what things look like because it's demystifying a process that remains elusive to many of us. If I asked for a show of hands in this room, many people would say, well, I'm not an artist. And many of you have heard you know, the expression that, hey, if you can sign your name, you're an artist. If you can walk, you can dance. If you can talk, you can sing. That's a beautiful way of looking at humanity. All our wisdom and intelligence happens when we meander around and play. <laughs> So it's important to be able to see art for that, to see how it captures moments that we can all share, create solidarity, create important connections. There's something so simple about painting murals that we forget that just in the act of making a quilt together, raising a bar together, painting a mural together, something essential to humanity is occurring. When we dance together, when we sing together, when we paint together, we're doing what we and our DNA have been evolving for thousands of years to do. But it's so simple, we don't think it's enough. I moved to Los Angeles after I'd been in Chile after the dictatorship, and I was lucky enough to meet Judy Baca, a great Chicana muralist in Los Angeles. And she sort of helped me start painting murals in Los Angeles, but not before she, you know, she had to vet me. So it was during the Contra War, and we altered murals all over the place. I, I mean, billboards. This is the first mural I painted in Los Angeles. It's called The Celebration of Diversity, and basically it's portraits of people in the neighborhood. I had gone to Canoga Park, California, and I was looking for, okay, what kind of mural am I gonna do? I've been commissioned to do a mural. It was the first time I'd been commissioned to just go and do a mural. Now, they knew I was gonna do a mural kind of based on uh, you know, community or something, but something remarkable happened that right out of that red door, there was a child care center. The door opened, and all these people, and all these magnificent colors and cultures came out. And there were grandmothers waiting for them. The mothers were all at work. And one of the grandmothers had, I can, you know, right to the right there on the woman on the right, you can see she's got a little <laughs> photograph into her lapel. It was a Salvadoran woman. And she had a picture of her disappeared relative. And I said, oh, this is great. Let's just, let's just paint a mural reflecting these children and these people who were part of Los Angeles. I didn't know, but because I had painted portraits celebrating the diversity of Los Angeles and showing images in the background of the diverse cultures that were living in Canoga Park, that would lead to other opportunities. One of the opportunities I had when I was living in Los Angeles, and now, you know, California used to be Mexico, y'all. Pretty recently, really historically, and it still is Mexico in so many ways. Los Angeles is a segregated city. I'm sure all of you have heard of East LA. You can walk for blocks and blocks and not hear a word of English spoken. You can buy any kind of Latin American product you want. But the Chicano experience is an urban experience centered in the United States. And they really wanted to go to Nicaragua. But now the Contra War was going on and it was a really different Nicaragua we went back to. In this picture, we're talking to a woman about a wall that we're seeing in a park and saying, they're very 
could paint a mural there. And I'm with the director of the National School of Public Art, the director of the school, you know, um, National Art Academy. There's no gasoline. These, these men do not have cars. We've walked all day long and we finally come across a place where we think that would be good for a mural. This is one of the orphans that was living in the, in the park that we put to work. What's really interesting is that some of the people on this Chicano delegation, there's three very important LA artists now right here. There's Barbara Carrasco to your left. In the middle is a very accomplished Chicano muralist from Los Angeles, Carlos Callejo. And the woman to the right is Irena Cervantes. I really like this mural too because, you know, we're just entering the computer age. Oh my God, it seems so long ago, but it was really important to go, hey, we need to use computers and new technologies in this new world that's being created. But the issues are all the same. You know, the, the idea of la migra, of migrants working, of helicopters circling, Here's Barbara at work. Kathy Gallegos, you know, we're, we're all a lot younger, but everybody that went to Nicaragua in that delegation came back with more resolve, with more understanding. The park was finally named Mother's Park. All these women standing here had lost someone during the war. Well, other people were interested in murals. One day working at the Mission Cultural Center, I get a call. We get a call at the Mission Cultural Center where we're pulling silkscreen prints for the community there. And uh, Renee says, hey, there's some Irish guy here on the phone. There's some Irish band. They, they want to tour the mission and the murals here. I go, who is it? He goes, I don't know, some Bono guy, U2, something. And I go, just tell Jose to go, our friend in the brigade. So he goes, and then, you know, next time they come through, they say, we want you to bomb this stage while we're... So you get a bunch of kids and do this as we're, as they're, you know, doing their concert. So you'd think that Painting in front of 80,000 people, you get nervous. But you don't. You feel like nobody can see you. You're like a fly on the wall, you know? It was a huge moment, though. And it's a huge moment when art, and having made art, uh, somebody who has the ability to talk to millions of people from whatever position they come from, it's an amazing opportunity to get them to say something that will help many people. Solidarity works that way. Um, this is Salvador Allende down here shaking hands, doing his first campaign for the presidency. He toured Chile in a train going all over the country, and people would be waiting for him at different stations just to shake his hand. And I found all these photographs of him. Since I had been to Nicaragua, when I was in Los Angeles, Nicaraguan musicians would come to uh, Los Angeles to sing about um, what was, you know, to, to share their music and culture of Nicaragua and share what was happening in Nicaragua and to denounce the Contra war against them. And. Um, I met Jackson Brown, the musician at that time, uh, helping this Nicaraguan musicians. And at some point, somebody said, you know, Francisco's father, and you know he's an artist, because we had just been, I was just the guy that would go and get, he would give them equipment, I would drive in my pickup truck, take the Nicaraguans back to my house, we'd all sleep in our apartment, you know, take them to the concert. And so Jackson points out about me, and he gets really interested in, in Chile and what's going on. And he asked me to do this album cover for him, you know, when they still made albums. It was really making a whole package. But 
um, we make this thing, and then it gets nominated for a Grammy in design. So it was a big deal for me to go to the Grammys and to, to start like, uh, seeing that the impact of these. Now, I showed you these images of Allende's campaign because this album that got nominated for a Grammy and went all over the world, it has embedded images of people waiting for democracy, waiting for freedom, waiting for Salvador Allende. So there's images of people waiting for him at different train stations. It's kind of like an unknown thing, but there's Chilean kids all over it, rescued from the past. Well, of course, Jackson, because he had supported Nicaragua, and now we had done that, he was instrumental during the plebiscite in which we voted no, uh, like many musicians, came to Chile, Amnesty International, how big, big concerts. So it's kind of small steps that you take that kind of influence the tide, not knowing what's going to happen. I got an opportunity to do some murals in the subway station in Los Angeles. This is my Chilean friend, a ceramicist who had been imprisoned for a long time. I'm being shown a card of five minutes, but I'm going to go over a little bit, but I'm going to talk a little bit faster. <laughs> These murals are called the sun and the moon. They're in one of the most diverse places in Los Angeles. And um, what's important to note is that the message of these murals is that places belong to the people that love those places, build those places, and take care of those places. They have a right to belong as, as anything, so the, these murals celebrate the people of Los Angeles, the working people of Los Angeles, and it shows images of people working based on pre-Columbian motifs. I've been working at the Museum of Tolerance for many years in Los Angeles. I'm really interested in, in um, the programs that they do there that teach about human rights, about the Holocaust, and about civil rights. I've done a lot of programs for them, and I've also been working with incarcerated youth all over Los Angeles County for around 20 years. It's not a far, far cry from Chile. One of the, I was just telling someone just a little while ago that, that one of the most impactful moments for me as a kid was going to the concentration camp my father was being held at. So when I work with these incarcerated kids and I've worked with them, it's very important for me to understand that they also have been victims Many of you heard about the LA uprising in 1992. Um, that led to a lot of murals. Here we're painting the uh, police chief discovers Los Angeles mural. And that mural was used for, for many events and situations during that period. But something very important happened for me during that period. You know, Los Angeles was in flames. There were, there were people uprising. Some people call it riots. but um, people were rising up because of the Rodney King verdict. Some of you maybe remember. And here's a really funny picture where we created a performance piece with people of different communities. And it sort of cemented my uh, feeling that um, I was in the right place, even though I had arrived through the death of my father to, to this place. During this performance, we told stories about ourselves. And this is the story I told. It was how I became an American. As you know, my father died on Embassy Row. And I feel that I have a special belonging to that particular place where he died, and a particular belonging to Washington, D.C. that I take as my birthright because he died there and because I grew up a lot, long part of my childhood there. And this is what I wrote for that performance with people of different cultures of the Americas. 
I built a shelter of cardboard and hunger of people searching for hope in my eyes still full of smoke, tears, and fear. I collected stories, names, places, and taught them to my children's children. And my name read Bolivar, Lautaro, Colón, Fidel, Compton, Yoruba, Carib, Appalachia, Mesquito, Esclavo, Jesus, Inti, Francisco, Antar, Yemaya. I became a child of slaves and workers of Jews, smoke of places changed and connections forgotten. I became Welen, Baraka, Thelonious, Armstrong, Farrell, Silvio, Kila, Bayun, Santana, Twain, Neruda, Kiche, Hopi, Crip, Mong, Oaktown, Blood, Brown, Harper, Cortaza, Sweet, Honey, Frank, Truth, Oki, Wobbly, Jara, Chasky, Wolf, Sosa, Potosi, Warrior, AIDS, Atahualpa, Tijuana, X, Cosmico, Aslan, Joplin, Mapu, Sochi, Milko. I built a shelter of future and blood, chopped wood, and continued the count. Coretta King, Angela Davis. This is a picture of a cell in Monsonar concentration camp where they interred Japanese American citizens during the Second World War. Yeah, I can, I can join up with them. I can be part of those histories and I can still be a Chilean. When my father's remains were brought back to Chile and buried after uh, democracy entered into his grave, I brought prayer bundles from Asian Americans, from African Americans, from Native Americans, from many cultures in the Americas. And underneath this stone in the Santiago National Cemetery are pieces of all those places that I've been. Pieces from St. Lawrence, pieces from Los Angeles, pieces from Manawa, pieces of the reservations I've been to, pieces of the urban cities, and they're physically thrown into the dirt there. And when I was throwing those pieces, people were looking at me with great curiosity, but they don't know that a piece of all the Americas is buried under that black stone. I'm just gonna go through these last things because we're we've run out of time. This is Ring of Peace in Belfast. Northern Ireland painted during the Peace Accords in 1998. It's been a great mural there. It's kind of towers above things. It's pretty large. You can see me down there working away during a cold, that's a sunny day during the cold and wet Belfast winter. This is St. Anne's Quarter. So this mural sort of made, made this quarter into an arts district. And now there's many murals there. But this is the mural today. It was sold to somebody. They changed the meaning of the mural. They made it into an advertisement. This is another disappeared mural in my neighborhood in Venice with portraits of around 35 people of the neighborhood. What a great mechanism to create community. You go around to all the different places, all the people, and just put them all in one one wall and then people that never talk to each other come over because you know you want to see yourself being painted and then, oh, you're in the mural too, oh yeah, I live across the street from you, et cetera. But this mural was also taken down after the Pioneer Bakery went out of business, the whole building got demolished. But it led to other works. This is a mural in in, some, in, in El Bosque, which is a district of Santiago, at a health clinic, and I just sort of recreated the, recreated the um, native forest of Chile, created a healing figure there. Of course, all these murals are done in collaboration with other people. You saw my collaborators stand up at the beginning of this talk. This is Carlos Lizama, who makes sites of memory at different places where people have been disappeared. These are murals, cult cultural memory murals in Oregon. Hey, memory is so important, but memory doesn't have to be a greeting. 
It can be a celebration. The murals that I've created have led to great connections. I ended up in the Amazon with, with uh, Patch Adams uh, in Iquitos in the district of Belen. This is one of the places with the highest infant mortality rate in the Americas. Many of these children in these photographs, here's Patch Adams, have passed on already. So it's crazy to work in a place where you know that the children may not survive. I really love working in collaboration with people. So my artistic practice is a lot about talking to people. It's not just what we paint, but it's the way we create opportunities to talk about things that are happening to us. Uh, three years ago, I got the opportunity to go to Berlin on the West Bank in Palestine to paint murals. When you arrive there, you think you're in a scene out of a sci-fi movie because there's a huge wall. It's huge. It's surrounding the village, and all surrounding the village, there's these beautiful luxury condos. But on the other side of the wall, the other side of the wall, there's Palestinians living in a village. And they've lived there for thousands of years. And their access to their olive groves is gone. So painting anything there is tremendous. All there is was graffiti there, and I didn't want to paint on the wall. We might have. I don't really want to kill the cage. I wanted to put paint in the village where people lived. But I got to work with a lot of young people. Oh, there's that. <laughs> um, so I got to work with all these young artists from Ramallah, the big, the big, the big city there on the West Bank. And uh, we created all these murals, and they formed a muralist brigade called the Flower Brigade. So I love that when I've been somewhere and a brigade occurs. Great feeling of camaraderie. It really captured the feeling of painting of when we were in Nicaragua. Conditions, as you know, in Palestine are very hard. There's no trash collection. There's very little water. It's hard to get resources. It was difficult to get paint. But the, uh, the feeling of being part of something that helps people express themselves, even amidst great difficulty, is awesome. An artist that created the Flower Brigade now. But we have also experienced a lot of violence. They have a weekly march through their olive groves. And on this march, we were ambushed by tear gas. Before I'd gone to Palestine, people said, well, surely you're going to avoid all this kind of stuff. I was, of course, I'm going there to paint. I'm just going to stay well back. What I didn't know was that the path goes down into a dip, and the Israeli armed forces are all around you, and they lob tear gas. It doesn't matter if you're on the front of the line or the back of the line. She was hit with a tear gas canister, this woman on your right, right next to me. We got gas pretty badly. Two people died in the past two years from the tear gas canisters being hit. We were raided by the, you know, after they knew we were painting these murals, we were, we were seen as a target. I do a lot of my own work that has to do with human rights. This is a project that we did in 2016 in Washington, D.C. This is Ronnie Carpen Moffitt, the woman that died with my father on September 21st. In the mural, we have a lot of embedded declassified documents. Over the years, we've found out a lot more about things. Tamara here must be an expert on all these declassified documents coming out of Chile. But as we painted the mural, one document that we had had that had been redacted every time it was released, um, we found out 
that the US government had known and believed that Pinochet had ordered the death of my father. And some of you may remember we were trying to bring him to trial, that he had been arrested in London in 1998. <laughs> So the redacted document, the document that had been released, finally was released without that part. So the United States government knew Pinochet had ordered the murder of my father, but kept that document. We were unable to use that information to bring him to trial. Memory is so important some of these kids that I worked with in Washington, D.C. go to the same high school that Rodrigo Rojas, whose, his name has been in the news recently because they finally found who had uh, found guilty the people who had taken this young man who had grown up in Washington, D.C. and son of an exiled family. And they just found them guilty. He died in 1986 takes many years. These kids go to the high school he went to. I was lucky that Michelle Bachelet, then president of Chile, was in Washington, D.C. at the time and came to, it wasn't Prince Harry, but President Bachelet came to um, inaugurate the mural. I was very honored. This is in the Central Valley of California at a historic building that celebrates the writers and poets of the Central Valley. Some of you may not know, but the Central Valley is one of the most diverse places of California, is one of the most diverse places. You can hear around 40 languages being spoken there at any time. I'm just gonna end on the work that I'm doing in my community. You know, homelessness is a big issue throughout the world and in my neighborhood. This is two blocks away from my house. I'm working with Venice Community Housing to create more housing, affordable housing. Right. Working with local youth and painting murals on the holdings of Venice Community Housing to say, hey, when you build affordable housing, when you create a commons that, that creates space for, for all people, you actually create assets for communities. That's what I do locally. I'm trying to get this building built in which many of these artists from Venice who have now been evicted can return to live and to create affordable housing that creates common spaces that everybody can enjoy. These are my brothers. That's my little niece at the inauguration of this bus that was finally put in place last year in front of the Chilean embassy right before um, the ambassador for Michelle Bachelet had to leave. It was a little gift for the incoming administration, which is a conservative administration. I'm sorry I've gone over. I want to just share this last photograph with you. It's my mother and father coming into New York Harbor. <laughs> 